have been serenaded by the headlines. We have seen it. Consensus arrangement shaky. It's not certain. But, you know, for the last couple of weeks or so, we have been following what's been going on in the political space. As a matter of fact, we knew when we entered 2022 that perhaps most of what we'll hear this year will be politics and the arrangements by political parties as they head into the election year 2023. Tomorrow is the convention of the All Progressives Congress, uh, which will be holding here in the Federal Capital Territory. As ordinary people, non-card-carrying members of political parties, should we be interested in what happens in, within political parties? Is there a way we can influence what happens there? Uh, what should be our concerns? you know, in terms of what, how the system throws up leaders whom the generality of the populace eventually go to vote come 2023. So this is some of the questions we will be asking this morning and we have with us Dr. O.K. Ikechuku, who is the Executive Director, Development Specs Academy. You're welcome to the program, sir. Thank you very much. I also know that we have a guest in our Lagos studios. Uh, Mr. Toye Shobande is a strategic leadership consultant, a lawyer, and the President Stevens Leadership Consultancy, also a member of the International Leadership Association. Association. Mr. Shubande, welcome, welcome to Sunrise, Sunrise Daily. Daily. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Let me start with you, Dr. Kichuko. Um, I'm sure that you are following what's been, or you've been following what's been happening. I was going to ask you about Anambra, but let's focus. Don't go there. Thank you. <laughs> let's start with, I mean, come on, why shouldn't I go there? Isn't no, 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 slapping thing? may soon become a requirement for holding public I office, so don't go there. I wasn't talking about the slapping. Come on. <laughs> Give me a little credit. Anyways. Tomorrow is the convention of the All Progressives Congress. They have been moving this convention uh, for months now. I think the Ketika Committee, which they initially inaugurated, was given six months to make that convention happen. Uh, it's taken well over 18 months for the convention to happen. But finally, it's happening after a lot of shenanigans. Uh, and we're asking, as ordinary people, should we be concerned about what happens within the APC tomorrow? We should be concerned about what happens within the APC. We should be concerned about what happens within any political party at all in Nigeria. Mm. Because the outcome of what happens in those parties will impact us, will impact the future of the country, will impact the next generation, and will impact our rating in the international community. Now they are in the process of choosing a party chairman. That's in addition to processes leading up to 2023. That's the emergence of a presidential candidate or presidential candidates for all the parties. I think we should be concerned. And our concern is not at the level of empty criticism, grumbling on name calling, no. Um, an evaluation of the candidates being thrown up, the amount of support they have, what they can be seen to represent will define the profile of the party. Remember, there are two basic publics evaluating what's going on there and with a thorn as the actors. Those in a political party may decide that they want so-so and so to be their chairman. Observers outside Nigeria will look at the history, record performance, disposition, economic standing of the person they've chosen, and they'll draw their conclusion. That if you could arrive at a consensus concerning Mr. A or Mrs. B or Madam B, it, it must mean that <clears throat> this is your perception of governance, this is your perception of the role of political parties, and this, you think, will give Nigeria a better future. So observers from outside will look at it, oh, if you could choose this kind of person, we are worried about what you have in store for Nigeria. Mm. Now, the level of the citizenry, what I suppose would ordinarily have happened was that within the various political parties, um, state chapters of the party, there will have been meetings, there will have been rallies, there will have been discussions, in which case, uh, what do you call it, an organic um, basis for deciding who will be the chairman will emerge. But what I see in the parties, and it's not about IPC, is that the big boys and girls meet among themselves, declare their preferences, many of them with a clear focus on the economic uh, outcomes, eventually. And so we find that it's not about the people most of the time. It's not even about the nation. It's not about development. It's about holding the nation. 
and taking the free funds coming from under the ground because development is not on the table. We've been retrogressing progressively. And what many of the parties overlook is the needed distinction between the fundamentals of leadership recruitment and the incidentals. The incidental is that you announce, OK, Kichuku as your new chairman. The fundamentals are these. What type of person have they chosen? What has been this person's record? How democratic is he? In any case, given his trajectory, both before now and now, is he a supporter of internal party democracy? If he is, good. If he is not, how will that impact the growth of democracy in that party if he becomes chairman? Or how will it impact the development, fundamental issues of democracy in the nation if the person becomes president? Those are the issues, and we should be concerned. Because this conversation has consistently excluded the people. Mm. The change of this, yes, the parties themselves. Think back to the days of uh, Alajisha Ushagari. Chairman of the party was um, chief. I don't remember his, I don't remember the name right away. You, if your chairman calls you, you come. That is the leader of the party. Today, political office holders are leaders of political parties. And so you see that a damaged notion of godfatherism has come into play. The older notion of godfatherism under Zeke, under Wu, under Saamadu Bela, under Aminu Kano, was that I, am an, I represent a certain ideology about leadership. And so I nurture you to drive that further. The recruitment process is to create a replacement generation for people who believe what I believe. Now, Godfatherism is about putting somebody in place whose hand you use to pick the, the, the yam from the fire when it's ready. And so you see that that distortion has moved Godfatherism from ideological godsons to, um, if you like, people you used to pick meat from the soup when nobody is looking. Mm. Now, that does further damage <clears throat> and is not helping democracy. I know that you are one of the very few people I have heard argue about how the you know the concept of godfatherism has been um, has been changed into something that is now negative. I think you've argued mm -hmm. in the past that it necessarily ought not to be, and that is something that is even allowed or ought to be in a system. Uh, but I have heard you you know so many things that you have said in your opening statement. Now I'm a little confused as to which line to follow um, in terms of state capture. How sometimes this is about deepening uh, the hold on on state capture, and it's not about the people. The question, and you've also spoken about internal democracy. There's plenty of talk right now around consensus arrangements, yes. and interestingly, the new electoral act mm -hmm. addresses that to a large extent. You know, demanding that if there is going to be a consensus arrangement. I mean, we saw the long debate about direct and indirect primaries, primaries. when the uh, National Assembly insisted that direct primaries would be the only way that candidates will emerge. Uh, but we saw that when they eventually included the consensus option, they decided that all the parties involved will have to write in signing <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, sign mm -hmm. that you know they agree to that this. this will be the consensus yeah. candidate. I, one will wonder how that is going to change the dynamics for what will happen tomorrow and even for the other uh, parties as they go into their own conventions. But let me quickly throw this uh, to Lagos, uh, to Mr. Shibande, if he if agrees, he agrees. Uh, that the people should be interested. And if they are interested, how do they influence the process from the outside? <laughs> At this point, thank you. <laughs> um, I did appreciate um, Dr. O'Kay's uh, uh, opening statement, and he, he quite uh, nailed it. So it's going to be like flogging a dead horse now when the big boys and the big girls have sat down and they've decided this is the consensus candidate they have. So right now, uh, the general atmosphere is that the people feel very helpless. Helpless in being able to make a representation as to what is their interest. And there, we're now talking about building a political system that throws up an effective leadership process or leadership recruitment process that is already truncated. So what you're going to have is um, people will not be responding, they will rather react. And the reaction, of course, it will be negative. It, uh, of course, the internal dynamics of the politics uh, in this political party itself will be on the edge. Uh, you see a lot of uh, internal protests, internal agitations. The best they can do right now, which uh, most people in the political parties do, is to rush to social media and cry foul and make noise. 
and at the end of the day, nothing happens. Why? The people themselves are not involved in the funding of the political parties themselves. And what you don't put your money into, you don't have the mouth <laughs> to actually even say anything. So the funding of the political parties rests in the hands of the big boys. They are the ones who own the party. They determine what happens and what will not happen. So if the people will have to have a say, then we have to review the finance structure or the funding system, funding process has to be very transparent such that when people make contributions to the funding of the political party, because right now when you look at the dynamics of how people are selected, the funding comes largely from maybe selling of forms, is so elitist, is so high that the average Nigerian who has ideal democrat uh, democratic instincts or views cannot vie for office. 20 million as at last night, uh, they've made over 700 million naira, and the president was saying that as a result of the consensus candidates, all the uh, aspirants who have paid money, their money should be refunded back to them, which was not so before now. Once you pay, you pay, you are, it's gone. So with that kind of dynamics, it limits people's ability to be able to make any effective contribution to change anything. But does it really limit uh, their options? I mean, yes, we have two main political parties, but there are other parties. Yes, I mean, yes. so what can the people do if the, mm. the, the candidate thrown up by this party and the other party does not seem to go well with the people? They don't mm. quite see the qualities they're looking for. Mm. Isn't there an option for people? And I'm not, maybe I'm talking to third force, fourth <laughs> force, or fifth force, or whatever. But can't the people do something? The people can do something. We can, there are always options. The challenge is with the timing. This is year 2022. The election is 2023. The politicians don't wake up in the election year to plan for elections. They plan for this 10 years ago. They built structures 10 years ago. While a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of us were sleeping and going around our normal business, they were mapping out strategies, they were building structures, they were spending money. Right now is the harvest time for them. So when you come on and you start, you start agitating, you are trying to disrupt their plans. They'll take you out. Mm. But there, there's something uh, Dr. Uh, Ikechuku said earlier about the, the leadership of the party. By the way, um, Dr. Ike, uh, Ikechuku, uh, the chairman of the National Party of Nigeria at the time that you were trying to remember is um, Chief Augustus Meredith Adisa Akinloe. Mm -hmm. And it, it is true, yeah. Chief Akinloe spoke as national chairman of the National Party of Nigeria, yeah. everybody responded. Yes. Even the chairman of the Unity Party of Nigeria, the leading political uh, opposition at the time, mm -hmm. the chairman spoke, mm -hmm. everyone listened. Yes. But it would seem like that's not been the case for a while. Even, I think even in the Third Republic, mm. the chairman of the Social Democratic Party was Babagana Kengibe. Yes. The chairman of the um, National Republican Convention was Chief Tommy Kimi. Mm -hmm. They spoke, members listened. Mm -hmm. All political interests listened. Mm -hmm. But it seems that that's been kind of toggled now. Yeah. What do you think is responsible for that? It's the power structure. The power structure backed up by who is paying the bills. The current the issue right now, who is what is the current funding structure of the average political party in Nigeria? Is there a reason that was toggled? Because there is a, a way we have run presidential system of government in Nigeria yes. since 1979. Yes. Please. And it included this thing that you're talking about, the mm -hmm. funding structure and everything. Okay. Everyone who wanted to be a part of the party, they played their role and yes. all of that. So uh, it would seem perhaps that the PDP, for instance, is trying to reorganize itself by mm -hmm. having a, 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 a national chairman that can be listened to and all of that. Exactly. And you, he spoke, everyone listened. Mm -hmm. But isn't it, I don't know. That is what is playing out with the recent crisis between Wike and Obaseki where Obaseki has to assert his authority to say that at the state level, I am the leader of PDP here. Then I'm wondering, where's the chairman of the PDP for that state? Why is he not involved in that conversation? When a man will boldly come out and say that to you, he's saying that, look at the resources at my disposal, both in terms of uh, uh, instruments of violence, the resources in terms of funds, the ability to be able to provide uh, the needed infrastructure for the party to thrive in the state is in my control. Mm.
Pardon me. Let, let me quickly take this to um, uh, Dr. Kechuku. Some of the points you made, I just wanted to, I just want to hear how it resonates with him. So, Mr. Shubhaji thinks that you know what, people are perhaps late already to the party because uh, this 2023 elections was perhaps planned a long time ago, and he, he believes that he will pay the piper, dictates the tune naturally in the political setting. But I'd like to take a cue from what's going on in the APC right now, because you'd hear the governor say, we agree with what the president wants. This is what the president has said, and we'll go by it. But I, I'm, I, almost, uh, I almost doubt the fact that the president pays, I mean, the party structures, or is responsible for the funding of the party structure. So do you think that that uh, Mr. Shobande's idea of who he who pays the pipe and dictates the tune, uh, I mean, takes the day across board. Yeah, it does. You pay the piper either in cash or in kind, or you threaten him. Look, if you stop piping, I'll gun you down. <laughs> so the president wields some level of veto power. He's a dominant force in the party. He can affect your fortunes as a person. And so to that extent, Everybody is genuflecting and trying to respond to the president's reflexes. If you don't, you're taken out. So that makes a lot of sense. But I'll take two related points. Uh, Shubande has made up, made the, uh, raised the issue about, um, what do you call it, it boils down to internal party democracy. If you pay, you get, your, you get the ticket. But this is how, if the parties are serious, they should choose their candidates. That's for elections. Let all party members send in expression of interest at a rate everybody can, for, can, can um, what do you call it, can afford. If you like, even if you make it 10,000, that's assuming it's not the big boys who will start continue funding subsequently. And so people do that. It actually will make the party stronger. With those expressions of interest, the party constitutes, whether for real or delusional, an evaluation committee, First at the state level, that look, in your state, your people believe you're good material for the presidency. And you, so the numbers are first of all, uh, what do you call it, moderated at the state level. A bit of the money you want to throw around goes into local party chairmen and state party chairmen. And out of the state, one person comes to the federal. Then there's a further evaluation using known criteria for leadership. What is your experience? What, are, what policy issues are you looking at? What's your understanding of the current national um, problems? What solutions do you have in view? How does that fit into our party uh, manifesto? How are you going to create consensus, etc.? Now you begin to assess the candidates. Where that will help the party, even in the area of funding, is that the big boys and girls can then choose from all the candidates which ones to su support. The horse trading can still go on, but you have placed it on the table. There is the illusion or intimation of democracy. Now, that would make a lot of sense. To that extent, if all these people are then brought forward to assessment, for assessment, what's going to happen is that you and I may decide who to support. So all the money he's bringing and the one I'm bringing and 10 or 20 other people, you see that people will queue up around several candidates. But what it means is that funding of the party will not then not just be, because the form, the, the matter of selling forms for 20, 40, Atiku obtained his form, according to him, paid by his friends, 40 million naira. Already that, I mean, is a statement about the elitist um, inclinations. But if he says he's open, and I went in, I'm a labor leader, I believe I should be the one who will lead this country, and I buy my form for 50,000. Now, I lose at the state level. It tells the growth of democracy. So that's one thing to look at. But now, the matter of whether the people can make any impression like he said, you see, you don't buy a generator after Nepal has taken light. The time to buy a generator is when you have electricity, and during the day, preferably. The party is over. It's not even that they're late to the party. In any case, they've also not been contributing anything to the party, either in terms of ideas or money. And in the last 20 years, we've evolved a culture of arms given in politicking. I come, I pay, you call me leader, you help me rig re elections. And somehow you manage to make yourself believe that I'm coming to Abuja to serve your interest. When I, in fact, have paid you up front. What kind of nonsense is that? But, um, and so doctor, I come here, you're saying, oh, yes. Uh, pardon me. I, I just, I, I, I'm sorry. I recall this point you made. And, you know, in the trail of the, 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 the points you were making, it came back again. And as much as possible, a lot of people are 
they still want to buy that generator anyway. At least, perhaps there will not be light in the future, <laughs> but at least make preparations. But the president made this statement recently when there was a lot of talk about the internal politics in, in the APC, saying that, you know, the internal management affairs of the APC have been afforded generous media coverage over and above its importance to the voters of Nigeria. The president went on to say, when precisely the party's convention is held and who is the party's chairman is hardly a matter for the average voter. And you, you, know, you talked about how people should be involved, but it looks like the parties themselves are saying, this is not your purview. Wait till we're done, then you can now come to the table. So what do you make of that statement from the president? What I make of that is that the party leadership, and that's across all the parties, do not understand the meaning of political parties. They don't understand the meaning of party cohesion. They don't understand the relevance of ideology in party politics. It, that is the greatest proof of that. That I say something doesn't mean it's correct. What the president has said, is that true? Is that how political parties work anywhere in the world, all over the world? Is that how political parties worked in the First Republic or in the Second? The answer is no. When the people who constitute the bulwark of your party identity and existence, and you've come to the conviction, absolute certainty, that look, uh, chase them, let them be in the corridor. When we finish, um, somebody will talk to them. Already it's not a democracy. And that's what we've been present for, for 22 years now. It's not about APC. All the 16 years of PDP, was it any different? Was it still not the same thing of big boys and girls? And when you try to make a distinction between the two parties, APC is not made up of more than 60% former PDP members. So back to the issue you're raising and in substantive terms, that statement is incorrect, is unhelpful to democracy, it signposts the delusion and confusion in our political parties. And it further accentuates the, the mistaken assumption of the political elite in this country that, you see, we have Nigeria. When we finish t deciding what's good for the people, we'll go and tell them. Mm. Without well, a diagnosis uh, even of what is wrong with them. Okay. Well, so Doctor, we find that the crisis... Well, you, you, the, the solid point that you have made there only raises one question on my mind, and I'd like to throw that to uh, Dr. Shubandi here. The, the, the fact that, okay, so that's the position of the political, one political party and perhaps a no, good number of political parties. At the same time, we are calling on as many Nigerians as possible to join the political process mm. and not wait to the end of the table, that's which it. is the voting point. So with this position, with this opinion, from... That a highly respected politician mm -hmm. as the president, mm -hmm. as the leader of the ruling political party, how encouraging or not do you see that uh, for helping other people who are outside yes, to join any political party at all? It's not in any way. You recall I had mentioned on this same program some weeks back or some months back that we need to pay attention to the body language of those who are in rulership over us in this nation. Not leadership. We, do, not leader. we don't have a leadership structure. And these are the ways in which you discern between leadership and rulership. That statement is what a ruler will use to <laughs> converse with his people, to communicate to his people. He's not the first Nigerian president that will say that. We've had a president who had told us in time past that, oh, don't bother about us. This is a family matter that the PDP crisis at the time was a family matter. That one was shorter than <laughs> this. So the body language, the body language is not inclusive and in any way is not democratic. The foundational problem is this. Our political system in Nigeria, as far back as 1922, which was in response to the Clifford Constitution, was that political parties were set up to wrestle or to get citizens, Nigerian citizens, involved in self-governance. Why? Because we're under colonial rule. If you check the history from that time till date, we have never set out to have a political party. The closest to it was maybe the Nigerian Youth Movement and the PRP of Aminu Kano at some point. We have never had a political party set out to draw up ideological um, uh, uh, objectives of leading the nation to development or transforming the nation. We've never had it. So foundationally, when we look at our history, in 1951, because of the parliamentary constitution that we had, we had most political parties formed along ethnic lines. 
So each time political party formations happened in this country, it was in reaction. It was a reactionary thing. And that's exactly what we are having now. APC came as a reaction to the fact that Nigerians were tired of PDP in government. Okay. But my, my apologies, and I know you have a lot to say, a lot more to say about that. But so what that then means, what does that then mean for us as a people? Yeah. If we want to change the dynamics of politics, yes. we want to change the mm -hmm. process of recruiting leaders into mm -hmm. the uh, governance into governance. Yeah. But the recruitment agencies, yeah. uh, I'll, call, I'll call them recruitment agencies, which are yes. these political parties, mm -hmm. the recruitment agencies have a way of excluding potential candidates, if I can use that term, yes. uh, from drawing from what you have said now. So where does that leave the Nigerian? Where does that leave more than, well, a good number of Nigerians who are not members of political parties, but who should get involved in the process. Yes. A, a, and That's Elumelu, where we are having instance, a hard time. My, my apologies. I, I, and Elumelu, for instance, hasn't spoken about this thing for like ever, mm -hmm. and we heard his voice recently. I was shocked. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Akiomi uh, yes. uh, Adishino has yes. been, you know, literally shouting himself hoarse about the process of getting youth involved in the process and all of that, and yet we have this process that we have. So where do we go from here? What we need to do is to count our losses with regards to 2023 and begin to prepare to join the political parties. That's where the problem is. People are not members of the political party, and yet they want the dividends of democracy to come to them. You are not attending. Well, you know it. that. I'm sorry. You, you see what's going on in these leading it's political discouraging. parties. I know it's discouraging, but we have to do the dirty work. We have to do the dirty work. I, you see, I grew up in, in a home whereby my dad was in government and he was uh, you know, a political party member. I see how people come to our house early in the morning for meetings, and I see how they hold meetings late at night. A lot of us are career professionals. How many employers will give permission to their employees who are political party members to go and attend? So the, the issue is intertwined in a lot of ways. Mm. But we still don't give up. There's still hope. Get to be involved in the political party. Pick up a card. Go to your local government council. Be part of the local government activities there. Begin to cross exchange ideas. Begin to draw up proposals, begin to push it out there, if not directly to the uh, leaders of the party at the local level, bring it out on social media, put it out online. Let somebody come, because a lot of the political parties are not structured on ideologies. Mm. Okay. There are no clear ideologies. Yeah. Uh, I, I know Ma Ma that Maokwa would want to uh, step in at some point here, yeah, but let me ask uh, Dr. Okechuku. The issue you raised about the leadership structure of the political parties earlier, we have toggled it in this fourth republic. Do you see a path for us to uh, rearrange it such that the person in government is not the one in charge of the political party as we have it now? Given the way things are configured, that's not going to happen. It's as simple as that. The political economy of the operating environment make it impossible. We've created a culture of I spend, you eat, and you do what I tell you to do. So in the short term, that is not going to happen. Let's just uh, wake up to that reality. The other uh, added reasons why it's not going to happen is that when you look at followership, here we are talking about the elite and leaders as demons, you know, who are not trying to do the best for Nigerians. Can we focus a little on the Nigerians? Can we ask ourselves a few questions? That if any of us here becomes a minister today, that our relations party members, um, village people, what do you call it, and people from our state will not come and harass the daylight out of us? What was they say to a minister who was invited and queried by the community? You're a minister, you've been minister for four months now. We're not seeing the evidence here. And when he tried to explain that, look, a minister of the Federal Republic, if all I'm doing is for my people and other ministers are doing the same, there'll be no Nigeria. But if other ministers are acting like me, faith in the Nigerian state will emerge. They nearly threw stones at him. So this conversation runs the risk of, um, what do you call it, of canonizing the Nigerian, what you call the average Nigerian or the poor Nigerians. Is it not true that less than 10 years ago, a teacher somewhere in the north 
ended up as a governor because he stood up against the governor. He was posted somewhere terrible. The people went and called him to contest. How much did he have? Nothing. Okay. Well, so you must register presence and drive conviction. Allow me to, well, let me allow you to have a snippet of what we were talking about behind the scene from something that you said earlier about our challenge being followership. Where do we begin from? Don't also forget that the followers have their issues on their hands. They have to deal with a myriad of issues on a daily basis and evolving ones from time to time. Uh, and the poverty figures in making life easier, uh, fuel scarcity, energy crisis, and all of those things are there on their hands. And they still have the responsibility of recruiting people to serve them. And now it's an issue for them. How come? And how do we get around it? No, right now we are dealing with a totally distorted and bastardized environment. So we can't use this as paradigm. But is it possible to get people to refocus? The answer is yes. You see, every person has some degree of inherent personal dignity. If I'm your leader and I'm telling you, I call you and sit down and say, look, the way we are going, do you think this will work for us? I don't think it will work. And that's why I don't think I should go in a convoy of 13 vehicles. I'll go with two or three. Do you think, see, by the time the leader looks real, it becomes slightly difficult for more and more people to focus on misconduct. It becomes difficult for people to just use the fact that they are hungry to think that they are justified in misbehaving. You can endure hunger. Sometimes you miss breakfast. But you'll be seen to be mutual and joint sacrifice. Your convoys are increasing. Every month you pull out between 500 million and 1.5 billion money as security votes, and your state is insecure. Every month between, let's say, be modest, 150 million goes to the local government. Nothing happens in the local government, but we see it allocated. Everybody is quiet. I get into public office. I was using one rickety car. In six months, I built a 150 million mansion in my village or in the town. And I'm living like I've been on the moon all my life. Everybody keeps quiet. Now, and this is the reality. Yes. Uh, this is the current reality where, you know, people continue to see that public office is a source of, it has become like every other business. Yes, but you yeah. then see that there will be no incentive for good behavior. But where you find leaders mm -hmm. who on their own actually represent the kind of leaders in your soul you know to be leaders out of self-respect, you begin to act differently. Look around you, there are such people, you, found, you find within your, your, your community, the, the traditional ruler, there's a certain dignity to his person. There's a way he speaks. There's a sense of justice when he intervenes. If he deviates from me, there's a feeling of outrage. So we now migrate to the political level, and it will appear that reinforced rascality is a primary criterion for public office. Mm. Impunity as well. And so what's the cascade effect on the people? No, why should I be of good behavior? I mentioned the fellow who became a governor because people say this is the kind of person. You have such people all over the country. But you see, the political space is taken, like the president has said, it's none of your business. We are breeding an elite that is on an island, and between the island and the people, there's a massive body of water, and the people can't swim. But somebody can build a bridge, and that's what is not happening. Well, interestingly, within the APC, uh, we hosted quite a, a few of them here um, on our platform. You know, there was some agitation in terms of when this convention was not happening or, you know, was not going according to plan or it looked like um, a lot of things were not in place to make sure that it was a successful convention. Uh, there, were, there were several agitations within the APC no. uh, itself. I'm just wondering whether those kinds of agitations can cascade out. Because for those people, they said that they joined the political party based on certain ideals and that they were not going to leave until those ideals were entrenched in the system. And the way to entrench the ideal is to elect a party chairman. They've been in power for seven years. What are their views on the state of the economy? What are their views on hats men? Mm -hmm. What are their views on the current fuel scarcity? What did they say during NSAS? What's the indication that there's national cohesion under them? What's the ratio of appointments across the various regions in the country? You see, it's okay to come on TV and gripe about chairmanship because I have an interest in the chairmanship. In all that conversation, where did the people come into it? Nowhere. 
oh, I have this thing, the party is supposed to be this. So once you elect the chairman you want, that will make up for years of misgovernance. Once you elect a party chairman, they, what is this ideology they spoke about? So we must also in public discourse make a distinction be between those who's, who are inspired by political hmm? and those who understand party politics and party ideology. Position taking and positioning is when many of them are mistaken for leadership. Oh, this is my candidate. They are not supporting him. There is no party democracy. How, uh, how am I living? Yeah, but even party democracy, you have to ask why is it that, I mean, if political parties exist because we have something called democracy, mm -hmm. and within the political parties themselves, there is know, no such There thing. is no such concept. That's why I, in my... In, Aren't we in, in trouble already? Not in volumes of trouble. You know how what you call a really trouble, as he's going, he's speaking up more. The, the example, the, the reference I made to how to make the parties belong to the people. Look, choose, I want to contest, there's nothing wrong with it, through the, 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 the nomination forms open. You will see organizers who will buy the form. First, money will come into the party. Second, he will say, I contested. Do you, do you think that we missed a chance with, with the National Assembly having to go back and add um, the, the indirect primaries and consensus option. Do you, do you think that we really missed a chance when direct primaries was the only thing stipulated in the Electoral Act? Yes, it could have been. It could have been. But you see, the, the hammer came from the judiciary because no matter what law you make, it is the judicial arm of government that ultimately validates all laws. So that judgment struck it. But the point is that even the debate even the attitude of the governors, you see, it's not about democracy, it's about hegemony building. Because if you allow delegates, if you allow people who are appointees to be delegates, my appointees will vote for me. Now, my appointees are not the people. My appointees are not the people who elected. My appointees don't have constituency offices. Well, what the judiciary did was a different one. Uh, okay, it, yes, it, that's it's true. It's related, to, yes. uh, but that one about direct primaries and, mm. and uh, indirect primaries and consensus was the president. The president yes. said, if you include this, I will Count sign me it. Out. Uh, no, I will, I will sign, but if this is there, I won't. Exactly. Now, the National Assembly, supposing the National Assembly overrode the president, it will be the law, right? Why, Indeed. Why would they in the National Assembly? Because the National Assembly, uh, even the language of the National Assembly will say the government, forgetting that the government is made up of the executive represented by the president, the National Assembly headed by um, the Senate president, and the judiciary headed by the head of the judiciary. So that refusal or that failure to assert identity is part of what got us to where we are today. Sorry, this is the position we've taken. But if you look at the dynamics of the persons concerned, if there's a suggestion or indication or even proof that I'm occupying a certain position because I got this endorsement, it means that while I'm there, I must continue to be of good behavior. Mm. So you come apply a little pressure, I comply, democracy suffers, Nigerians lose. That's what we are living with. Otherwise, we had a chance in those provisions to actually move Nigeria into the conversation not just the political elite that has come to represent, if you like, a colony of locusts. Because look at the trajectory. You see green leaves in front. What you see behind are dried out stems. Mm. The expenditure on the ruling elite is abominable. It mm. doesn't exist anywhere in the world. And look at this. Any village you go to today, if you saw it, that village last in 1999, if you go back there, it will look the same. You won't miss your way. The parts are still there. The debt to the thing is still there, but there are a few new houses. People have grown richer, have become billionaires. So assuming even there's the, I won't use the word transfer of wealth, there's the enablement of the living environment so that local economies can thrive. It will make sense. But it's not happening. Now, look at what Soludo is trying to do in his state. If, for instance, you have to use the clothes made in your state, more people will start producing, and they will employ more people. If you use cars made there, the company will produce more. If you now use local delicacies for state entertainment, farms will come alive. That can happen all over the country. Gandhi, what did he do today? Tata vehicles all over the world, and Tata is producing heavy-duty military equipment even for advanced nations. When the man started, they were, they were laughing at him, just as they're laughing at him. Awesome. You know, so you find clothing, too. He brought out what he was wearing, set it on fire in public in, an, in a rally, I said, listen, 
For as long as you wear this thing which is imported, you're creating more factories there. All of you are jobless. Now, that's the kind of leadership that will lead to faith. That if you say, look, don't misbehave. They say we shouldn't. I think we've suffered enough under this misconduct. But it's not happening at the national level. Mm -hmm. We're talking about position taking. We're talking about who. And the illusion remains sustained that, look, give this man the position of chairmanship. Well, I know that Mr. Shobande spoke to how, you know, we do things on an ad hoc basis and we're, we're more reactive and how the APC came into existence as a reaction to, you know, years of, uh, let's say, tiredness that within reaction. the PDP. I, just one or two sentences of reaction. Okay, just two sentences. And I, I'll throw it back to him. Every political party is a reaction, either to an existing reality or to the political processes around it or to the change he wants to introduce. Mm -hmm. That's why I could generate an ideology. It's a reaction to the reality. So hey. react, um, um, parties exist as a response to social and political reality. I thought I should add that. Well, so there will be questions as to how well this uh, experiment has worked. Tomorrow they'll be hosting another convention, and I'm trying to bring it down to you know, the, the reality that we currently have within us. This party has now... Uh, been in governance at you know at the federal level and also uh, in different states for at least seven years and there'll be questions as to how well they've done and if they haven't done well you know if the people decide that they haven't done well or they have done well it's up to the people but tomorrow uh, are we going to be looking on helplessly as things unfold within the APC or do you think that you know as the convention takes place tomorrow people can actually make demands of, you know, of what they expect should go on within the party? Um, I don't want to sound like um, uh, <laughs> a pessimist, but we are, we are just going to sit down and look. That's what we're going to be doing tomorrow. <laughs> That's the realistic thing to do. Let's see how it plays out. And like we normally do, let's pray, which is our most favorite action in this part of the world, that... Uh, God will intervene on our behalf. He will fight our battles for us. And uh, they will implode. <laughs> I, 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 I see the sarcasm you're into this. That's room. the only thing there, you know. But to give people any false hope and say something magical will happen tomorrow, but nothing will happen. Uh, so uh, Dr. Kechiko has spoken about the kind of leadership uh, yes. we want to see. Yes. Uh, you said it's rulership earlier, or not leadership. But mm. tell us what kind of followership we shall see 11 months to the general elections, mm -hmm. and there's a job of work. Whether or not we will see Don Luke for tomorrow or not, but there's still some work ahead. Yes. For, by the way, we still have a government, we still have governments in power across board, mm -hmm. the federal, states, should I say local, let me just put it there for the record, but yeah. we still have a job of work to do now and in the future. So what kind of followership uh, should we be seeing? Uh, we, we need a responsible followership, responsible in the sense that First, we obey the laws. We know the laws. We understand the laws. We comply with the laws. And by so doing, we are aligning with the cultural context in which leadership can be effective. And when I use the word cultural context, culture there is the prevailing mental model, which informs people's behavior. Now, if you look at the current behavior of the followers, it suggests itself that they themselves are not interested in wanting Nigeria to progress. Because I, I say it all the time, I am in doubt as to whether the average Nigerian is interested in Nigeria changing. Why do you say that? People prosper in the time of chaos. Like um, a famous actor said, chaos is a ladder. Anywhere you see chaos, somebody is profiting from it. People who profit from the chaos in this country will not want the chaos to stop because they are profiting from it and they will take out anybody who wants to stop the chaos. There is, um, there is a, a sophistication to the madness in that chaos. So is it people or some people or the generality of uh, Nigerians? Dr. Because... Kijuku said something very fantastic, that if you pick somebody from amongst us in the followership and throw them into governance, the real person will emerge. So some people say we've been recycling leaders. Sometimes I say, I don't think so, because the new ones that have showed up, they've not done anything better. So I don't have any guarantee that a youth in Nigeria today, with the current mental model that he or she has, will go into government and do anything better. How is that to change? Because we're wondering now, how do we change that paradigm? 
education, 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 social orientation and reorientation. The current agenda on anybody's plate right now, discussing Nigeria, they discuss their belly first, they discuss their future. You cannot agitate a better future for somebody who is hungry. You cannot discuss development of Nigeria for somebody whose future looks bleak. But that's their reality. That's their reality. So we have to have a form of communication that gives some hope and also gives some reality to this fact that, look, you can't solve this problem within the four years tenure of a governor or the eight year tenure of a president. Okay. You have Dr. to Kejuku, be part of the process. Thank you. Dr. Okechuku, how do we change the paradigm? Uh, we, I, I don't believe that we are helpless. So how do we change the paradigm? especially from the followers' perspective. Oh, it's, 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 yes, it's not so difficult to change the paradigm. If, you've had, if you have, remember when Buhari came in, there was a lot of hope. And if you think back carefully, you recall that for close to two weeks, we didn't have power failure, surprisingly. Now, a leader who is seen to be what he says he is, that's one thing. But matter of changing the paradigm, we have to rework the concepts with which we are trying to introduce change. You know, we speak of um, the youth, that the future belongs to them, they are leaders of tomorrow. I think part of the education my colleague mentioned is that our youths need to understand that there's a difference between biological age and ideological age, or ideas age. A lot of young people have held office in this country, and they're still holding office even as governor. What's their track record? So I can be biologically within the age you call youth, and my ideas are the ideas of 90, 50, 75 years old people who have got us to where we are. Oh, I've been a PA, I've been an SA, I've been all sorts of things. And all I did within that period was actually to carry a bag, sometimes organize rigging, sometimes organize local uh, social events. And to that extent, I've acquired no leadership skills. And I've come to understand leadership to mean privileges. When I'm going, I have my own PA, to even though I'm an SA somewhere, I go in official vehicle. So I acquire the reflexes of the very people that have got us where we are. And because I'm biologically young, you assume that a young person has taken position. So knowledge, that distinction needs to be reinforced so that young people begin to understand that any position you need to, to, to take, there are skills required for it. And let's do an evaluation of some of their platforms, National Nigerian Youth Council, National Association of Nigerian Students, if you recall about two years ago, the person imagine the president was a 42-year-old person. Mm. Now, those organizations have not been led by students for more than 25 years. They've always had at least two presidents. And when you associate with them, each of them has a jeep doing what? So the, the platforms for leadership recruitment have also been violated by politics. You go to youth council, is the same thing. Slightly elderly people are the stakeholders. They are the leaders in all the states. And so you find that they are consulted on political matters. Now, effective leadership can change all that. They say a tree doesn't make a forest. That is open to argument. It's when you're thinking of shrubs. It cannot make a forest of shrubs. But where you have an Iroko, it has declared a forest. There's Iroko there. You respect that piece of land differently. A leader with the right focus, ready for the kind of sacrifice and all of that, that will begin to percolate. You, feel, you find, quickly find people who feel the same way, but for whom the environment is very inclement, jumping out to say, yes, let's back up this man. And I hate to be, appear to be going back to um, Soludo, but you see that people are excited. Imagine what it will mean. The shoe you're wearing is made in your state. The dress is made in the nearby state. That is empowerment. Mm. This thing they say, empowerment program, you gather young people, Dr. teach them how to make soap. Yeah, we're, we're, we're almost totally, in fact, we are out of time. If you leave me, I'll go until next week. I, I, I know that for a fact. So let us, you know, call it a wrap here. Uh, we have to thank you. We, we hope that, you know, tomorrow will not just be a case of Sidon look. Um, I said that we, when the political actors themselves are not here, because I, I know that they certainly will have a very different perspective. But hey, we'll get plenty of that. They're lucky uh, they're not here. <laughs> much later. <laughs> we have to thank you both for coming on the program this morning. Dr. O.K. Kichuku is Executive Director, Development Specs Academy, and Mr. Toye Shobande is a strategic leadership consultant, a lawyer, and also President Stevens Leadership Consultancy and member International Leadership Association. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on Sunrise Elite this morning. My pleasure. Thank you.